welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. You probably remember that after 9-11, many folks said that life would never be the same. David Letterman asked the question if anyone would ever laugh again. And yet, we all came back to normal. Today, many are asking similar questions about the coronavirus. Will the world ever recover from the potential deaths, the financial markets, world trade, supply chains, and particularly the impact on Asia. The world's economic reliance on China, the outsized influence of China as a result of its Belt and Road infrastructure initiatives, and the nexus with other nations in Asia. Relationships that are both symbiotic and competitive. To try and help us sort through all of this, I am joined by Prague Kahana. Prague Kahana is a leading global strategy advisor and a best-selling author. He is the founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm, and the author of The Future is Asian, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and both a bachelor's and master's degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. It is my pleasure to welcome Prague Kahana here to the Who, What, Why podcast to expand on his recent Wired magazine article on how the coronavirus is traveling along the new Silk Road and what it means for the future of the Asian system. Prague Kahana, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be back with you, Jeff. Well, it's great to have you here. One of the earliest things you talk about in this piece is the remarkable parallels between what happened back in the 1300s, a virus that spread, that started in Asia, that spread to Italy and, and, and other places, that really parallels what we're seeing today. Yes, that's exactly right. It is truly uncanny. Uh, If you change one letter of the province where the uh, plague broke out in northwestern China, that was uh, Hebei, uh, and you change it to Hubei, that's where Wuhan is the capital, where the current virus broke out. They're obviously in the same country. Uh, The plague spread westward along the Silk Road. It reached Iran and devastated more than half the population of Persia, which at the time was what's called a Khanate, uh, a protector of the territory of the Mongol Empire. And it reached Genoa, entered Italy in the year, I think, 1341 uh, through the port of Genoa. So you have, of course, today the main clusters of this being similarly China, Iran, Italy. And it's not necessarily a coincidence, as I point out in the article, Iran and Italy are two of Italy's, uh, two of China's major trade partners along the Belt and Road Initiative, which you mentioned at the outset. So there are really these eerie parallels around how travelers and traders have, uh, you know, enabled the spread of of this virus. And given the long incubation period, it's, you know, very difficult for us to know, you know, how many people are genuinely affected. And obviously the weaknesses in these countries, health systems have have been uh, been revealed. And by the way, it did spread from Italy uh, back in the 14th century northward and uh, decimated so much of the European population. And, uh, of course, so many uh, Chinese people died as well. So it led to a great fracturing or rupturing um, of the uh, Mongol Empire, which is the largest empire, the terrestrial empire in human history, as opposed to the British Maritime Empire. So clearly this virus can have geopolitical uh, consequences and ramifications, which I also go into. And you argue that, that this also could have serious geopolitical implications for China specifically, for Asia, and also for the relationship with the rest of the world. A lot of the trade, a lot of the manufacturing that we take for granted out of China today is already being pushed into other countries. Uh, yes, that's right. So, you know, I want to be clear that this is a trend that has been underway for a long time in the sense that, uh, you know, ch- supply chains have been shifting out of China for almost 15 years because of the rise of wages in China. Uh, and so this is an organic economic process just around price competition and so forth. Then you've got the new trade agreements, which have facilitated the shift of supply chains. You also have the rise of those Southeast Asian markets themselves, like Thailand, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and, and you know, companies, American companies, want to make things in those countries, not only because they're cheap, but also because they're growing markets of 100 million, 200 million people. Um, And so there's many, and then you have the trade war in the last couple of years, which has also led to tariffs on Chinese goods. So those countries have become more attractive. And now you add to that the virus, right? So there's a good five or six reasons in sequence over the last 10 years that have paved the way for more and more global companies, especially American and European companies, to say, you know what, 
we're we're not done with China, but we're not going to make everything in China. We will make in China only the things that we sell to Chinese people in China. Everything else we're going to distribute and make it more di distributed, diversified, and therefore more resilient. That's something I've been advocating, uh, especially in my book, Connectography, kind of which is about the geography of global supply chains and infrastructure. And I think that that's uh, a lesson that uh, companies are starting to pay uh, you know, very close attention to now. And within Asia, by the way, it's worth adding, the mistrust of China has been very high for a very long time. Right. Uh, countries are wisely suspicious, you know, of Chinese intentions. And they're obviously very upset that China hid, um, you know, uh, the evidence around this virus and allowed millions of Chinese people to travel uh, abroad, most of all, obviously, within Asia itself to these countries over the last couple of months without doing anything about it. So this will only heighten and am amplify the suspicion that uh, Asia's neighbors have of China. And that also means that they're going to fight harder to capture the, the supply chain so that they are less dependent on China. What does this mean for the ongoing Belt and Road Initiative and those things that are already in, in the works? Right. No, I'm very, very glad you raised that as well, because, uh, as again, going back to the Mongol Empire and the Silk Road analogy, if the Belt and Road Initiative is the new Silk Road, uh, then, and you have a fracturing of that authority of China and influence of China and a slowing of its economy and the mistrust of China, that's going to mean that more and more countries are going to say, you know, it's fine to have one connection to China, one road, one railway to China, but let's make sure that we build more connections among ourselves so that we're not dependent on China. And again, just to be clear, that has been underway for quite some time. Um, you know, uh, um, countries have been saying that they don't want to have all their debt be issued by China. They don't want to owe all of this money to China. They don't want all of their investment to come from China and so forth. So much as like what's been happening in terms of trade patterns within Asia, similarly with the Belt and Road, you have countries being a bit skittish about all of this foreign infrastructure built by Chinese workers in their countries and the debt that it entails. So I think that there is going to be, again, this was already underway, a growing sense that other countries want to have more ownership over Belt and Road rather than China owning all of it. The other half of that, I suppose, is that if China is backed into a corner, if suddenly they become, if not the enemy, less than the benefactor that they've been, how will they respond to this? Uh, well, that's a great question as well. You know, there's action and reaction. You know, it's a very dynamic sort of process. Well, China has had already been in the process of softening its dominant position and saying, you know what? We shouldn't own all of Belt and Road because we can't afford it anyway. You know, China is actually going into current account deficit. It has a trade deficit now. It doesn't want to spend trillions of dollars of its own money to uplift these other countries. Meanwhile, they're, they're being, you know, they're suspicious of it, right? So China had already been multilateralizing Belt and Road, meaning saying, you know what, let's let others invest, let's let other companies involved uh, from other countries. You know, Europe has been pushing very hard and saying, hey, you know, we have the best engineering companies in the world. We have the best railways and, um, and, and, and uh, you know, building and construction, not China. So we should be doing this, and we don't want China stealing all the business. So China has been backing up and saying, okay, okay, fine, let's get you more involved. So what will happen in the next couple of years for sure is that a combination of all of these things will lead to China um, uh, basically, uh, you know, having to be forced into that position to do more of that sharing uh, of the uh, both of the burden and of the benefits of Belt and Road. And will the, the virus accelerate that process, do you think? Uh, yes, you know, absolutely. Again, for all of the reasons we've been discussing, it's the suspicion of China, it's the throwing markets uh, that uh, that China, uh, you know, sort of is is, is suffering, and um, and the desire of countries to you know have more control uh, over their own you know international uh, commercial relations. So yes, the virus again, as it much like it fractured the Mongol Empire, uh, you know, one almost has to giggle at so incredibly uncanny the parallels. Um, you know, I I do have a feeling that this will lead to uh, the return accelerated return of what Asia has almost always been characterized by, especially since the, the collapse of the Mongol Empire, which is what is called multipolarity, right? Multiple powers, China not being number one. And this is really the core thesis of my uh, Future is Asian book. I did not call the book The Future is Chinese, right? I called the book The Future is Asian for a good reason, because China has never been number one in the world, and it's never been number one in all of Asia. 
because Asia inherently is so diverse. You have the Indian civilization, Japanese civilization. Russia is actually an Asian power. Persia, meaning Iran, Korea, Australia. Um, in, you know, India, the United States is still a major military presence. There are many balancing powers to contain China's rise. So the notion that has taken hold over the last 20 years that China is inevitably destined to be number one and the prominent global power on the planet Earth was always a complete myth. It was always wrong. Uh, and, you know, I think that, that this will just be one more nail in the coffin of that very bad and dangerous idea. It doesn't mean that China isn't powerful. You know, I make very clear that China is a superpower. You know, 15 years ago, I started saying China is definitively a global superpower. I was even writing about Chinese influence in Latin America and all across Africa. So there's no question that China is a global power with very significant influence worldwide. That does not mean that China will be number one in the world, and it will not even be number one, you know, necessarily. It will not even dominate Asia. And if it doesn't dominate Asia, who is the net beneficiary in terms of geopolitical power in Asia from China receding a bit? That's a great question uh, as well. And it's it, it sort of it's a bit of everyone. Right. Again, the system tends towards the global system tends towards equilibrium, a, a stable distribution of power around the world. And, uh, you know, the United States has, was always going to be a major pillar of that. Right. No, no, nothing is really gotten in the way of America remaining uh, a major global power. We decide as America whether or not we are going to, you know, get our house in order and, uh, just, you know, deploy our resources effectively in a way that is amicable, you know, to our allies and partners around the world. And so long as we do that a little bit better than we're doing right now, America will still be a major global force. Um, Europe, same thing. Europe, you know, continues on the path of consolidation. Brexit is really an anomaly. You know, the rest of Europe is still growing together and finding more ways to integrate their military, integrate their financial markets, integrate their banks. They have to, and they'll get there. And then within Asia, you have China, you have the rise of India, you have Southeast Asia, the other Asian powers I mentioned before. So everyone wins a little bit, and China starts to win a little bit less. That's basically what is going on. What are the lessons that you think, if any, that China learns from this experience right now? Again, you know, really, really good question. You know, we obviously all wish there were more transparency in China in terms of their uh, learning from experience and their listening to others. Uh, so, you know, it is a bit of a black box, so to speak. But there is this echo chamber imperial effect that happens in lots of countries, even in democracies, where leaders only, you know, hear what they want to get told or you only listen to what or only get told what they want to hear. Um, and that is obviously problematic. So one hopes that they come out of this, you know, um, getting the strong feedback and pushback. Again, this has already been happening. You know, I can cite instances from Kazakhstan to Mongolia to Myanmar. Singapore, Japan, lots of countries push back on China and say, sorry, you cannot own, you know, 100 percent of our utility grids and power supply and, uh, you know, mining uh, assets and railway infrastructure and airports. Sorry, you know, we have laws, we have sovereignty. So that pushback was underway and China may hopefully start to listen to that pushback. Obviously, you have the huge domestic criticism within China. As much as they suppress and censor voices, we know that uh, the, much of the population, uh, educated class, young people, they are aware that the government mishandled this and all of their propaganda cannot you know, do away with that realization that, that the, the common citizen now has. Um, and that makes people angry and the government probably realizes they have to you know, soft pedal that a bit. Will there be any more attempt at transparency as a result of this? I mean, also, given the history of SARS and swine flu and now and now COVID-19, will there be greater transparency for whatever the next pathogen might be? Well, you know, so there's, uh, you know, modifications, adaptations, concessions that are made over time. So, for example, you know, they've said that they're going to close these live animal markets, right? So no more live animal trading in these closed halls where viruses spread. And, you know, as you rightly pointed out, there have been all just in the last 20 years, multiple major outbreaks that have uh, emerged from China. And so they obviously know that if they don't close these live markets, they're going to lose the, the trust of the global uh, public. So that's certainly uh, part of it. So that, that is, you know, I wouldn't call that transparency. It's just a change in policy. 
a real transparency would mean, for example, you let American CDC teams and other international health monitors, uh, World Health Organization, you know, deep inside the country, in the same way that we try to inspect the nuclear weapons programs of uh, countries like Iran, you need to have absolutely clear and open and transparent monitoring if you are genuinely transparent. Is China going to have, uh, you know, give give the world that level of transparency into its public health system? Of course, it's not. It absolutely will not, because as a matter of pride, as a matter of sovereignty, it won't. Uh, right now, their propaganda machine is out there saying that maybe this virus emerged from an American lab. Maybe it was a CIA bio warfare program. So this is hardly the government in China that's suddenly going to say, you know what? Let's open our public health system to the whole world to analyze and assess and let, you know, please help us to make ourselves better. You know, the only concession they're making is let's all work together and please provide us lots of surgical masks because we're running low. You know, so they're, they're not interested right now in you know, becoming more transparent. As a parallel question, what can we learn from the way China and other nations in Asia right now are handling this virus from a public health perspective and who's doing it right and who's not? It's a great question. So, you know, I live in Singapore and you've probably seen that uh, whether it's the Harvard uh, study or uh, many other uh, the World Health Organization and experts like Lori Garrett at the Council on Foreign Relations, they've all said, you know, if the whole world had a public health system like Singapore's, we would have, you know, uh, a small fraction of the outbreak. So this is the first country that became a cluster outside of China because it's not far from China. Uh, you have a huge amount of travel every single day, you know, dozens of flights arriving from Chinese cities. So you had, this was the first country outside of China to reach 100 cases of the virus and zero people have died. And I'm living here right now. I'm standing, you know, speaking to you while at, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking out the window at a very calm and peaceful uh, landscape of palm trees and so forth. Life continues as normal. Not a single Singaporean person has died. And let's bear in mind, this is the fastest aging country in the world with the most lopsided aging demographics, just like Japan. This is a small version of Japan. So, you know, according to the demographic math of this virus, a hell of a lot of old Singaporeans should be dead right now. And instead, the answer is zero. And that's just a fact. You know, I mean, this is um, a place I've come to live the last few years. And you have to admire the transparency of the system. They published on the front page of the newspaper every day what to do if you feel sick. They made uh, virus tests absolutely free and open so that no one fears that they can't afford it uh, or that they wouldn't be able to afford quarantine. Everything is completely free. Um, you know, they had videos made to air on television and everyone, well, you know, what to do if you don't feel well. And uh, they, you know, encourage people to self-quarantine uh, if you've been, um, you know, sort of, uh, um, you know, sort of if you're infected. Just every possible sensible, commonsensical thing you would expect. Uh, you know, if you and I as non-public health experts were to make a list of the 20 things you would want to do to contain a virus, they've done all 20 of those things. And again, they lived through SARS 15 years ago. So they learned the lessons, they embedded the best practices. Again, this is probably the only country that's getting the credit, you know, now for having contained it. But it is a very small country. But it doesn't mean that larger countries can't do it. Look at Japan. You know, Japan is a very large country, uh, well over 100 million people. But again, it's wealthy. It has solidarity. They invest in public health. They trust their government. Um, you know, all of those things, therefore, are happening at a larger scale in Japan as well. So, look, you know, we're, we're live in this situation right now, as you know. We, it's not too late, hopefully, for us to learn uh, from some of these things. You can't have people who are infected disobeying quarantine and then going out and partying and going to work and so forth. Because, again, two weeks later, uh, you will have a big spike in numbers uh, as a result of that one instance. And you're never going to be able to trace it back to who met whom, when and where. So we really should be taking this a lot more seriously the way uh, these smaller countries have done. How much of that comes from the attitude of the people in the country, in Singapore, for example, in, in terms of the way they approach this and their mindset from the very beginning? Most people in this country alive today remember very vividly the SARS outbreak and how many people died. It was over 100 people, if I'm not mistaken. 
uh, or maybe close to 100 people. And uh, it was devastating for the economy. You know, the, the city was shunned, uh, as were many Asian countries, because it spread so widely across the country, you know, from, from uh, across the region from China. So they said, we cannot have that happen again, even though they can technically afford it. It's a rich country, but you don't want to have that happen again. So you have the trust of the people and the understanding of the people, because most people in this country remember it vividly. They went through it. You know, um, it's hard to think of another uh, analogy. Let's take, you know, in the case of, of the U.S., where we haven't had a kind of pandemic in recent years that all the population would remember. But let's take the 9-11 terrorist attacks. You realize that, you know, there are 80 million millennials in America and a certain, you know, similar number of Gen Z. You know, young Americans say this is the first year where college, uh, you know, students entering college and even our youngest recruits into the army were not alive when 9-11 happened. They can't remember it, right? So similarly, how do you have a psychology of preparedness for a terrorist attack or a major geopolitical disruption on your own soil if so, such a large number of people really don't physically you know, remember what happened? Um, so I think that that psychology that you're you know, referring to and that trust in, in government really does matter a great deal, uh, whether the situation is a pandemic or whether it's something uh, like a terrorist attack. Does the situation in Singapore, the fact that they have been so successful in, in literally containing this virus, give encouragement to the rest of the world that it is possible if the right things are done? Yeah, you know, that's already where the conversation has shifted in the analytical community and the media. People are saying, hey, look, you know, China is claiming the lowest rate of new infections. They've taken these draconian, you know, sort of measures to quarantine entire cities. Um, you know, so what China has done and Singapore has done are, in a way, look, let me, let's separate the two. You know, is Singapore is a victim of this, whereas China is a cause and a victim. So we can't treat them in the same conversation. They obviously both have strong governments that can get things done. But uh, from the perspective of, you know, China should not exactly be gloating, uh, obviously, given that they caused this whole thing. Uh, however, uh, the fact is that when once this, once you have a viral outbreak, it doesn't it's, it's, it's no point. There's no point in playing a blame game. You just want to stop it. So do the steps, you know, that that uh, that China has been able to take in terms of strong measures and the quarantining and mass treatment and that kind of thing. Is that what you do need to do when you don't know how far it's spread? Yes, you do need to do it. Is China the kind of place that can do that kind of thing? Yes, evidently. Does that bring down the rate of infection? Yes, it does. Should we be doing something similar? Potentially. Right. And that's what experts are recommending. They're saying, you know what? Just stop for two weeks. Just everyone stay at home for two weeks. Have a staycation for two weeks. And uh, and then we can get a grip on this thing. So in China, you can just say it and that happens. In our country, you know, obviously uh, in the U.S., it's a lot harder to do that. But, you know, we would pay the price for not listening to experts. And as you look around the rest of Asia, finally, how are other countries handling this? And, and who are the ones, other ones that you give good grades to and, and not so good? Oh, boy. Well, you've got to worry about Korea, obviously. You know, huge outbreak there. Definitely the largest number of infections and fatalities uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in Asia outside of China. So they're still fighting a pretty uphill battle. Again, even though they're a very modern, developed country, it also has to do with that fact that they are so modern, developed. They're hyper-connected. And so people move around in high-speed public transportation and, you know, air, airplanes. It's a very dense society, right? 50 million people packed into a space that is, you know, uh, I'm not sure what U.S. state I would compare it to, but a relatively small one uh, or a mid-sized one, right? Uh, so 50 million people, let's say, packed into the, uh, you know, smaller than, than say, Oregon, right? Uh, so so that, that, that's, uh, you know, so that density is an enabler of the spread of a virus, right? So, um, you know, I, I, again, first world rich country, but I am, you know, a bit worried about whether or not they're going to be able to turn the corner on this. The, the smaller and poorer countries of like Southeast Asia, like, you know, Vietnam and, uh, and, and, and uh, Thailand, let's say, well, they're mid-sized countries, you know, anywhere from 80 to 100 million people. They're also in trouble because they've only belatedly blocked Chinese travelers from coming in. A country like Thailand that is, you know, has a very large ethnic Chinese population and lots of Chinese travelers coming in. They don't, they're so laissez-faire, they're so blasé about it, they never even stop Chinese from coming at all. So it could be that millions of people in Thailand have the virus and they don't seem to know or care. I mean, I don't want to belittle uh, the psychology, but they've literally done nothing, 
you know, I mean, they're, they're just happy-go-lucky uh, <laughs> land of smiles, as Thailand is known. I'm not so sure that that in the long run is going to lead to, maybe they think that MSG, <laughs> the kind of stuff they have in their food is going like, to kill it off. This is a very, you know, a joke and poor taste, pardon the pun. But honestly, when you sit here and you live here in Asia and you compare the responses around the region, you look at some of these countries doing nothing, that obviously is not just, you can't just throw your hands in the air and say, oh, well, it's like, you know, literally, what are you thinking, right? Get a grip. So you can't at a point, you know, with the world being so connected, the, you know, the response, our system is only as strong as the weakest link in the chain, right? Because you have millions of people moving around every single day. So we cannot afford to have weak links in the chain. And I appreciate, obviously, as well as anyone, as someone who works in development, you know, economics and, and, uh, and globalization research, I appreciate that there's very uneven standards of development. And I have a lot of sympathy for that, uh, as much as literally anyone can. I was born in India, so I know what, what a poor country looks like. Um, however, that means that we have to give even more resources to, uh, you know, help these places that are underdeveloped catch up, uh, because you can't have that many weak links in the chain and expect the chain not to break. Parag Kahana, I thank you so much for spending time with us today on the Who, What, Why podcast. A pleasure. I look forward to uh, having another conversation in the future. Thank you. And thank you for listening and for joining us here on Radio Who, What, Why. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.